I want to, uh, again, greet, the, greet you guys and greet those watching online. Thank you so much for being with us today. I want you to grab your Bibles and just flip anywhere because we're bound to end up somewhere <laughs> this morning. Amen. I do want to make mention uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah began um, Friday at sundown. And um, if you don't know what that is, that's the beginning. It's the head of the new year for on the Hebrew calendar. Of course, we go by the Gregorian calendar, but um, the Jewish uh, new year began on uh, Friday, sundown on Friday. And so um, and I just want to just just, you know, uh, you know, I'm not real big on um, different. Th I'm real careful, I should say. But I do want to. I found that this was very interesting. Was that the new year uh, is five seven eight four? So we're stepping in from five seven eight three into five seven eight four. And five seven eight four, um, each number is connected to a letter or a word. And um, this one five seven eight four is connected to the word. the the The, the name is Dalet, which means door. And, um, and so you can say that this year, 5784, is called the year of the door. And so I really believe that what God is speaking to his body is get ready for some open doors. Yes. Yes, sir. And get ready for some closed doors. Yes. And so you're going to be seeing some open doors and you're going to be seeing some closed doors. And know that that was already... Um, designed by your father because there are certain seasons that have expiration dates amen yeah. and, um, and so God there's gonna be some closing of some doors and some opening of some new doors so my, my, my communication to you is this is get excited because as you as as one door closes God's gonna open another one that's designed specifically for you amen and so I'm excited about it. And so 5784 is the year of the door. So we're going to be teaching a little bit about that later on. But uh, this morning, what I would like to do, I was really felt led of the Lord um, <clears throat> today to uh, talk to you about God encounters. And I, you know, I've said it before. I'll say it again that, you know, I had a God encounter that wrecked my life. And I think everybody should have a God encounter um, because it changes you from, from a, some, for someone who just comes to church to an individual who's, on fire, passionate about the Lord, and you just can't just can't get enough of the Lord, and that includes. Um, I mean, even when it, in my encounter, I didn't want. I never. I always wanted to go to church. Anytime the doors were open, I was there. And so, every encounter is different, but mine was different because that's where God called me. Amen. And so, I just want to. I just want to just briefly share share some things with you. Uh, I've been. I was gone for two weeks, and um, I do have a lot. I have some things prophetically that I'd like to share with you uh, before we dive into that. So, let me um, find my note here. Uh, while I was gone, uh, I was at a uh, Labor Day weekend. I was in uh, Marksville, and um, and celebrating with that church, and did some things there, and. Uh, the Lord spoke to me and he said this. He said, a pioneering spirit leads to apostolic transformation. A pioneering spirit leads to apostolic transformation. And so the word apostolic always scares people because they automatically assume I'm talking about a religion. And I'm not talking about a religion. I'm talking about order. Everybody say order. Order. An apostle brings is a sent one that goes into regions, churches, businesses, and sets order so that transformation can take place. Um, in Numbers, if you'll go to Numbers with me, chapter number 13, we see something here that um, I want to look at and kind of build from. And um, I'm still in a series, but I just felt a lot of the Lord to just share this today. Uh, but Numbers chapter 13, and it won't be on the screen, so uh, verse number 26. And this is, a, uh, this is a good example. Of course, we understand that the 12 uh, disciples, the, the, the apostles were not formed yet in Numbers 13. But this is a good example of what an apostolic person uh, does. So let's just look at this for a moment. So verse 26, Numbers 13, out of New King James, it says, And they departed 
And they came back to Moses and Aaron and all of the congregation of the children of Israel in the wilderness of Paran. And they brought back word to them and to all the congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. So they had proof. And then they then they told him and said, we went to the land where you sent us. And it truly uh, flows with milk and honey. And this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and large. Moreover, we saw the descendants of Enoch there. The Amalekites dwell in the land. The Hittites, Jebusites, the Amorites, the Canaanites. And then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let's go up at once. Let's go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We're not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. And there we saw the giants, and we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. Now, for, for, to build a foundation, here we see they were, the, the spies were sent out to go bring back a report to Moses and Aaron to spy it out, see what's happening. They were sent out, and um, Caleb says, hey, this is the land that flows with milk and honey. This is a land... Um, that is ours. We can possess it. Possess it. Let's go. And then you see the others are like, eh, I don't know. There's big men over there. And so what you see is what usually generally happens in in church culture is you have uh, a, a leadership team or uh, um, a pastor or it could be a business leader who wants to move into something new and fresh and exciting. And uh, the, team, the leadership team is ready, to, is ready to move. And then a spirit of intimidation comes in to try to block uh, the team, the church, the business from moving forward. And so Caleb had a good report. The other guys were like, they saw the same thing Caleb saw. They, had, they, saw, they, they experienced the fruit. They saw the land flowing with milk and honey. But what distracted them were the giants. And, and in every church, in every season of our life, we're going to experience giants. But it's what we do with those giants that's going to either allow us through the door or we'll close the door. And so we got to understand that as we're going into this new year, the year of the door, that there's going to be giants. But we're well able yes, to overcome anything the devil throws at us. Right. Amen. We've been talking about um, spirits that hinder the flow of God in your life. And that's a giant. A demonic spirit is a giant, but you have the power to overcome it. I preached a little bit last Sunday before Pastor Jacob came up here, and we said that Christ nailed all that, all that mess to the cross so that you could be free. And then the, the, the Colossians said that he, that Jesus triumphed the cross, and because he did, we do. We have victory over every disease, over every bad report, over financial problems. We have the power and the dominion over it. We're over it, not under it. We're not under the law. We're under grace. Amen. So here we see Caleb and Caleb says, hey, everybody, be quiet. Basically is what he said. And he said he gave them a good report. But he also said, but we saw this. And then he said, but we're well able to possess it. We're well able. And I want to tell our church as we move into this new season, this, this new year, if you will, on the Hebrew calendar, we're well able. We're well able to, to receive all that Christ Jesus has for us. Well able. 
Don't let the distractions distract you from your purpose. So I was in my hotel and I just wrote some things and I just want to read these to you. Whenever God graces a man or a woman of God or a group of people with an unction to see personal, corporate, regional, and national transformation, then we need to understand that God has graced him, her, or them to operate in a dimension of kingdom function called the fivefold ministry for his kingdom's sake. I get really, really, um, I'm going to come off script a little bit. I get a little tired of seeing um, apostle this and bishop that and prophet that and teacher that when there's no fruit of their ministry. Jesus had his 12 and there was, and they followed Jesus and they did what Jesus did. Yes? yes. They had the fruit. Right? Yeah. And so I get really tired of folks, self-proclaimed prophets and apostles that have zero fruit, but want to have a name. And they, 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 they flash their credentials and flash their cards. That I'm this and I'm that. When, when the only title you're given is son. And so, so, so your title, my title doesn't matter. What I need to understand, my identity is a son. And it's really not pastor, apostle, prophet. Although those functions are important, my first place is sonship. And so we have a lot of guys in, that, are, that are just out there for their own cause for profit. Right. Yeah. And I don't mean prophetic, I mean profit. Yeah. Yeah. So we just got to be careful. Um, the, the word says that in the last days, there'll be winds of doctrine. And there's a prophet out there right now by the name of Brian Karn, who um, calls himself a prophet, who's going out there and saying that sin will never lead you to hell. So I'm just warning you, don't be, don't be following that ministry. But we need to keep our eyes open and our ears open because there are things taking place right now that if you agree with it, could really distract and detour you from your encounter with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Right. So... So the fivefold ministry, I've heard people say before, the assemblies of God, um, the assemblies of God don't agree with the fivefold ministry. And if you look at the papers, that's not exactly what it says. The assemblies of God's stance is, is that we disagree with it when it comes to people in name only with no fruit. What's the difference? Trust me, I've had, I've, I've been doing some research. And so I want this church to know and, and, and people on the airwaves to know that this church, we believe in the fivefold and we honor the fivefold. What, what, what frustrates me as a leader is when we have men or women or even groups of people that call themselves something they're not yeah. because they haven't been identified as a son. Right. So you don't you can't you, if you if you don't know who you are in Christ, it is hardly possible to function in a fivefold office. Right. Especially if you don't know who you are. You can say all day, well, I've accepted Christ as my Savior and I'm going to heaven. Yay for you. But do you understand that your identity is a son and you have access to your father? Like, how is your relationship? And so this is what I've written. And I said, it'll take a network of people that understand fivefold ministry to work together in unity to see personal, corporate, regional, national transformation to take place uh, in and around us. I, I wrote, leaders frustrate their calling when they operate on a level that they are not purposed to operate on. Leaders frustrate their calling when they operate on a level that they are not purposed to operate on. And many times leaders will feel this frustration and then they will internalize it. 
Now, I'm just, I'm just reading this because I'm going to go into something in a moment. So leaders feel frustration and they don't understand that the frustration many times is God saying there's an open door that I want you to cross over into, but they're so busy trying to be the pastor or trying to be the leader of an organization or a business or a family that now they don't, they're, they're trying to be something that they're not purposed to be in that season. And God's saying, there's a door that's open. I need you to cross over the threshold into something new. They don't understand it and they start internalizing well, no one likes me. And this is where most leaders quit. Is when they, they start internalizing, I'm not good enough. I, nobody comes to my church. I'm not like the big church. You know, we don't sound like everybody else. We don't act like it. And so leaders start internalizing it and they get frustrated and they quit. And you can take this as a, as a business or as church or even in family. And I really believe God is saying, Revive Church, there's a door of opportunity opening for you. And the frustration you feel in the spirit is wanting to move you through that door. I'm frustrated as a leader because I feel that pull into something new. And I, I hear the Lord saying, I'm creating a threshold for you and your people to step in, over into something fresh and new. But you're going to have to do it or you'll stay in a cycle of frustration. I also wrote and said they do not realize that their frustration is not about their style of ministry or their style of leadership. But it's oftentimes a call to come up higher. And if they refuse to yield to the spirit's calling, they will live in a frustrated cycle of pain and disappointment. And it's at many times at this point, leaders and pastors quit because they do not have anyone in their life that can help them navigate through a season of promotion. Let me tell you guys something. And this church, we're entering into a season of divine promotion. Few of us got it. This church is entering into a season of divine promotion. A few more. This church is entering into a season of divine promotion. And the reason why is because there's been seeds planted in this in this atmosphere, in this soil for over 90 years. That's beginning to bear fruit. All the work and all the toil and all the, the, the nails and the hammers and the tools and all the leadership meetings and all the prayer meetings and all those are accumulating into the heavens. And God is saying, whoa, what is that? I hear a sound coming out of Revive. I'm doing something new. Wake up, Revive. Wake up. There's a door that's opening. All of the years TGP did their thing. Well, First Assembly was doing their thing. Not knowing there was going to be a marriage that comes together that we would see together, a family brought together to see a move of the Spirit in this region. So God is saying, I'm opening a door to you and I'm closing some doors. Don't get, uh, don't get distracted by the frustration of the season. Many times that which is promotion is deemed demotion because there wasn't a voice in their life that was able to identify the new season God was inviting them into. This is all I typed this in probably 20 minutes in Louisiana. And I believe this is a word for not just for us, but for that church as well. So I typed this. And when I opened my first church, I became irritatingly frustrated. I said, yes, I'm called to pastor, but the calling upon my life was more than pastoral. I soon realized it was an apostolic calling to pioneer and to build something bigger than what I thought or what I was called to build. I tried to fit in the mold of a 
pastoral mold that I re that I remembered and that I looked at and that I, I looked up to. And as 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 hard as I tried to be a normal pastor, the more frustrated I became. And I soon realized I wasn't called to be just a pastor. I was called to build something for the king. I began to understand that my calling wasn't about me fulfilling my dream. It was about his calling upon my life. And so because my flesh is crucified, his calling upon my life is way more important than what I thought I was called to do. See, I thought I was just called to, hey, let's open up a church. Let's have a good worship. Let's have some good prayer time. Let's just see what happens. But God's plan for me was bigger than what I could even understand. I had to strip myself of expectations that I put on myself. I had to rip apart any and all imagination and imagery that I thought church should be. And I had to say, God, whatever you want is what we want for our church. So what we did is the Lord told me, he said, quit having church on Sundays. I said, fine with me. So we had maybe seven of us there on, in our little storefront on 27th. And, uh, and at that time, we, we were having praise and worship on a TV with Lydia Mero. Lydia, hi, if you're watching later. And she would be pipe in uh, Church of His Presence, Pastor Kilpatrick. They would do worship. And then when Pastor John got up there, we'd turn it off and I'd preach. That's how we did church. And uh, and. I just the, the night before that Saturday, the Lord spoke to me and said, I didn't call you to do church the way you're doing church. And of course, in my in my eyes, I'm thinking, well, I've always known church to be on Sunday. And so I'm, I'm and of course, I'm, I'm at that level of frustration. We've only been in church maybe a month, two months, and I'm already frustrated with it all. And uh, he said, I didn't call you to do what you're doing. I didn't you didn't ask me what I wanted. And so before we launched, a prophet, uh, Del Gentry, came to me and said, don't do church as usual. Well, of course, what do we do? We go back to what we know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. We always go back to what we're familiar with, what we're comfortable with. So we had church on Sunday. And um, that Sunday morning, I'll never forget it, I went, we had a little a curtain, and it blocked the sound guy from the rest of the room. And uh, I went back there to Jeff and I said, hey, uh, hey, what do you think about Saturday night church? He said, sure. OK. And so uh, now his thinking, as he would tell me later, he, he thought we were going to do Saturday and Sunday. And so I turned the TV off and I tell everybody because people were soaking, which is fine, but there was whatever. And so I said, everybody get up and sit down. And Jacob may have been there that service. I don't know. Um, I said, look. We're not doing church anymore on Sundays. We're going to do it on Saturday. And we're going to start it in July, uh, after, the July after July 4th. And so as soon as we did that, y'all, I'm telling you, as soon as we did that, we, we called it um, Summer Breakthrough Revival, I think it was called. And July, uh, June, uh, July, August, September, October, we had, I mean, more people that we could even fit in that building show up to our little room and uh, God, God moved tremendously. And so my point is this, is when you get out of the box of familiarity and in your comfort zone, God can do more. Amen. So we had church and we did that. And then uh, the assemblies of God called us and wanted us to, to uh, move into the building in Port Natchez. And so we did. And then the grace uh, left to do Saturday church. And we started doing Sunday church again. And um, we moved into that. And so I'm sharing this with you today because a door opened in the spirit. And I had to realize that grace had, had, had come off my Sunday morning experience over there. And God said, I want you to do something different. And we followed his instructions and God opened up heaven over us and we experienced a powerful outpouring of his presence. So what am I saying? It's going to take us to understand that God may not tell us, hey, do Saturday night church or do this or do that. But he may ask you to do something uncomfortable. He may ask me to do something uncomfortable. 
But I want to, to, to just mention again, frustration is not always bad. Frustration, if used in the right way, can catapult you into a new season. I hope that helps somebody. I said, all I knew I was supposed to do was open up a church, host God's presence, and expect Him to move. We didn't have any money. We didn't join a planting network, a church planting network. We didn't do any of that. And as I was typing this and in this, during the service, what I began to see um, in the spirit realm was I began to see the principalities and powers laughing and mocking the, the church. And um, but what I saw was in that a roar came from within the church and those principalities and powers had to be uh, eliminated or uh, 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 annihilated by the power of God from the sound of the house, the people in the church. The roar, the roar came from within and removed the mockery and the intimidation of the devil. I also saw um, what reminded me of a tug of war. And you had people on one side and you had people from another on another side and they were just it was a tug of war. And it was a tug from the past to remain nominal and to settle and a tug that moves you into prophetic fruition that releases a fresh wind of purpose. And it was a war. And I believe that's where, where a lot of the church is today. A lot of churches today really want to move the spirit, but it's a tug of war. Yeah. To remain nominal or to really go with the Holy Ghost. And we're going to go with the Holy Ghost. Yeah. We're not going to remain nominal and we're, we're not going to settle for little. We want all that God has for us. Matthew chapter 11 and 12 says, And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence, and the violent take it by force. Now, I don't, uh, let me say this. Uh, I did some research here. And in the Strong's, the word now there means to lift. It means to lift. Thayer's definition says this. It means uh, to raise up, to elevate, to lift up. And then the word violence here, the first, the, the says, until now the kingdom of heaven suffereth violence. Violence there means to be seized. To be seized. And then it says, the violent, this means uh, energetic. And then the word take right there means to seize. Then the word force there means to seize. <laughs> and so what I believe God is saying in this season is in this new season that God is bringing this house into, we're going to have to be intentional and aggressive in our pursuit of the things of God. Now, let me say this. Aggressive doesn't mean mean. I'm so tired of revival preachers being ugly and being mean and screaming at people and that's not the, Jesus, Jesus never screamed in someone's face. <laughs> he was loving and compassionate. Now, do preachers get excited? And yes, I get excited and I go crazy. Yes, that's different than taking a microphone and beating you over the head every Sunday. Because they're not you're not responding like the circus director wants you to. Because churches have become a circus nowadays. Yeah. But all I'm saying is there's there's a this what I'm talking about today where it says where it says. And the violent take it by force. This doesn't necessarily mean we're going to be aggressive. <laughs> you can take something by force by sitting and resting in God's presence. OK, no, you don't believe me. OK, you can you can take you can receive God's promises by just. I trust you, Lord. 
Aggressive isn't mean. It means that you know what God wants and that you're not going to budge from what he has told you. It means that, you know what? He's promised in the last days that we would see an outpouring of his presence. Okay, I believe it. We're seeing it. And what God is doing is, no, it doesn't look like Brownsville. No, it doesn't look like Toronto. No, it doesn't look like all these other places. But God's saying, I'm going to send you a trickle. And when you learn how to manage that trickle, I'll give you some more. And then when we, man, when, we, when we learn how to manage what he's given us, he's going to give us more. Yes? yes. I think, I think um, right, we're at a point where, where, where um, the body of Christ really needs to be careful because we're busy. Yeah. Busy, busy, busy. And are we busy doing his work or are we busy doing our work? Seize the season, seize the moment, seize the day, seize the opportunity. A door is opening and doors are closing. The year of the door. Now, let's, let me turn to this now. <clears throat> We're doing good on time, Pastor John. Thank you. I'm not going to be much longer. I just want to. I just want to just mention just a few things. Um, let's go to back to Colossians. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. And we're going to look at. Um, chapter 2. <clears throat> Colossians chapter 2 and 6, verse 6 says, And as you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in Him, rooted and built up in Him, and established in the faith, as you have been taught, abounding in it with thanksgiving. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. Verse 9. For in him dwells, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And take your holy highlighter and highlight it. And you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You are complete in him, capital H, complete in him. So this goes back to what I was saying a moment ago about understanding sonship. You're complete in him. So you got to learn that you, you're okay by being Charles. You're okay by being just Jared. You're okay by being just Phil. You're okay by just being who God has created you to be. Amen. Your identity doesn't come from this church. It doesn't come from your title. It comes from your father. Amen. I'm a son. Yeah. Bible says, and all creation groans. For what? The manifestation of what? So all of creation is groaning for folks to realize who they are in Christ. And when we take our place in Christ, man, things can change. You're a son. You're a daughter of the king. You're not who your past says you are. You're not who your employer says you are. A son. And it's all groaning. All of creation is wanting you to find your place. As a son. As a daughter. I read Colossians. Yes. For, and you are already complete 
in him. Now, Second Peter. Hallelujah. I'll give you time to get there if you're Second Peter chapter one. I always forget to give y'all chapter. Second Peter one. I've done that for a long time. <laughs> Second Peter 1 and 3 says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue and virtue with knowledge and knowledge with self-control and self-control with steadfastness and steadfastness with godliness and godliness with brotherly affection and brotherly affection with love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind, having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Therefore, brothers, be all more diligent to confirm your calling and election for if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. For in this way there will be for in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Verse twelve. Therefore I intend always to remind you of these qualities, through you, though you know them are established in the truth that you have. I think it is right, as long as I'm in this body, to stir you up by the way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon and I'll make every effort so that my departure may be able uh, at any time to recall these things. Look back here at verse um, 3. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. If you're a son and you're a daughter, this says here that his power has already granted to you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him. So there is there. And although life happens and things get crazy and and, and it, is, it is really, you know, as a human being, it's hard to stand on this 24 seven. It's it's super hard. But when you get back and you start understanding, and you read scripture and you you get you get the revelation that. He is mine and I am his and all things are going to work together for those that love Christ and that are called according to his purpose. Then guess what? You can sit back and the world may go crazy, but you're resting in Christ because you realize the importance of understanding your identity through Christ. I'm just trying to, I just really want to encourage you to understand that. You're a son and you're a daughter. And when you really understand how powerful that is, it'll change your life. Because now you're not living up to people's expectations because you've already got his expectations. You, he loves you. He loves you. He calls you. He knows your name. He knows how many hairs that you got on your head or how many hairs are leaving your head. <laughs> he knows and he cares about you. He cares about you. He care, Jesus cares. God cares that you're going through a tough time. He does. That's why he brings you to church, to, to fellowship with brothers and sisters that can help you if you allow them to. See, church, instead of being a country club, we got to understand that there's people around us who are hurting and who need a word from the Lord. And you may be that prophetic word. You may be just that hug that someone needs. You may be that smile that someone needs. 
But if we don't know how to yield to the to the to the the power and the presence of Holy Spirit, then we'll never be able to minister to that person that's sitting right next to you that's going through hell. I believe God really wants us to understand the importance of sonship. Yes. The importance. I'm not, I'm, I'm, Pastor John is just a, a thing that he allows me to do. I'm a son. You're a son. You're a daughter. That's your identity. Amen? Let's stand. We started off this morning by talking about the head of the new year. 5784 means the year of the door. The year of the door. I said that God's going to open some doors and God's going to close some doors. <laughs> some people are already saying it's the year of the open door. It's the year of the door. <laughs> Doors open and doors shut. Yeah. And let me just mention this. Uh, he's coming. Uh, let me just mention this to you. Is that if a door closes, don't see it as a demotion. See it as a promotion. If a door closes, see it as a promotion in the spirit. Because as I said a moment ago, a door closes so another one can open. Amen. Yeah. The year of the door. The question is, are we going to go through the door? Are we going to look at the door? Are we going to walk through it? What are we going to do with it? That, that, that decision is yours. With every head bowed and every eye closed this morning, I know there's people in here today that are dealing with, they're wrestling with decisions and they're wrestling with God and they're wrestling with their past and they're wrestling and Folks are tired of wrestling and they really need answers today. Father, you know each person, what they're going through. Father, you know that, Father, what, that, 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 you know their situation. You know exactly what they need from you. And Lord, I just ask that you begin to minister to those in this room today that need your touch, that need your help, that need to find answers. And Father, I just pray as a, as a church body today, Lord, that, that as doors begin to open and doors begin to close, that you give us discernment on how to, how to walk through open doors and how to navigate through closed doors. Lord, I thank you that, are, that each person in this church today, those that are watching their sons and their daughters, and Lord, we thank you for a fresh uh, understanding of identity. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that you're here. And you're helping people today. If you're here today in the, in, in, and you say, Pastor John, I'm going through some difficult things right now. With every head bowed and every eye closed. I just want you to lift your hand. Just some people. I see you, sir. God bless you. I see you, ma'am. I see you. I see you. I see you. I see you guys. God bless you. I see y'all. God bless you. See you. God bless you. Put your hands down. I don't know if you want to. I'd like to pray for you that raise your hand. Um, if you'll come to the front, I'll ask just come to the front. If you'd like me to pray with you, I really want to pray with those that are, dig, that are wrestling with some hard things right now. And if you're too embarrassed, I understand. I can, I can, we can pray later, but I really want to pray with those that are wrestling. That's the word the Lord gave me in my office a moment ago, that there's many of you wrestling. You're wrestling with some things.